the great peacetime invention of the 19th century became a deadly factor in the world wars of the 20th century. Railroads linked factories in the cities directly to the battlefield, increasing the scale of war far beyond anything that had gone before. Trains themselves would become part of the battlefield, both as targets and as weapons. And the strategy of war had to include this powerful new technology. The Industrial Revolution that produced the railroads also produced new and deadly mechanized weapons. Together, they would transform the shape of war. Before the railroads, armies had to live off the land when they went into battle. Trains made it possible to move and supply vast numbers of troops over far longer distances and at much greater speeds. The railroad's first battlefield was our own civil war in the 1860s. There was a major railway junction here at Harper's Ferry in West Virginia. The bridge over the Potomac was destroyed nine times and it was here that Confederate General Thomas Stonewall Jackson made his famous raid. It became a railroad war because the railroads were the invasion routes. And because they were, they were recognized. So they were used to fight the war and they were ripped up to stop the other side from fighting the war. And right here is a historic place because this is where Jackson entered on the world stage. Right here were two railroads and an arsenal. And Jackson, just a few hours after secession of Virginia, raided this arsenal. He took the guns and he started to rip up the railroads for 100 miles. And Jackson was a greater robber of trains than Jesse James, for he stole the biggest bag in the war. He stole 57 locomotives and 335 cars and moved them south for the use of the South. Jackson and his fellow Confederates realized that the North had two great advantages, heavy industry and better railroads. Trains and tracks became an obvious target for the Confederates. My great-grandfather, General Stewart, recognized the importance of rail and the incredible impact it had on providing supplies to the Union forces. And at every opportunity, he was in the business of providing deep raiding parties into enemy territory with several objectives. One would be to destroy supplies, but another very important element was to break up or dissect or damage any lines of communications. That could be bridges, that could be rails, and he was very effective at destroying these rails and bridges as a part of these deep raids in enemy territory. The North would rebuild tracks almost as soon as they were destroyed. This bridge over the Potomac was reconstructed in just eight days. One of the final showdowns of the war occurred here at Petersburg, Virginia during the winter of 1864. It was here that railroads led to a new battlefield strategy, one that changed the way wars were fought. The railways had this immense capacity to deliver arms and equipment, and above all, almost unlimited supplies of ammunition to a given spot, so that you could concentrate more fire on a battlefield for a longer period of time than ever before. And the only way to cope with that was by digging in. And it was this capacity of the railways to deliver that led to trench warfare and as a prototype of the horrors of the First World War, what, 50 years later, came during the last winter of the American Civil War between 1864-1865 round Petersburg in Virginia when both armies dug in. The trenches at Petersburg were the shape of things to come. Winter made both sides totally dependent on railways. The North sent in a steady flow of food and ammunition. With inferior railroads, the South ran short of supplies. Its troops began to starve. The railways had spawned a new form of warfare, longer lasting and deadlier than ever before. In Europe, trains also began to play a central part in war. In the 1860s and 70s, quick Prussian victories over Austria and France were partly due to Prussia's rapid deployment of troops by rail. 
In the new German state, railways were now central to military planning, the ideal way to move troops quickly to any border. From this point on, it was quite clear that in the future, everything would depend on making the best possible use, the fastest possible use of the railways, of using them to the maximum capability in order to start the war as soon as possible with the maximum number of people possible and with the maximum amount of supplies possible. So after 1870, there was no more any doubt in anybody's mind that the railways were the way to go. Count Alfred von Schlieffen spent 15 years drawing up a plan for total mobilization of the German army by rail. He calculated the number of railway cars that could pass over every bridge during every hour of a two-week mobilization period. He planned for four million men, plus all their food and ammunition. Each man, each horse, each gun was assigned its own place in the vast war machine. Only one thing was needed a signal to act. Von Schlieffen's plan was finished in 1905. The signal came nine years later. Das war am dritten Mobilmachungstag im August 1914. It was day three of mobilization in August 1914. It was all set up and ready to go. Everyone was waiting for the one order. Father had to report to his battalion. And we didn't go all the way to the station with him. We just walked along beside him for a while. I remember Father had a small tobacco pipe and he went off in a good mood. Everyone was very enthusiastic at the time. I mean, it was understandable because nobody really knew much about what war actually meant. And off he went, waving his little pipe and saying, we'll be home for Christmas. When the German army mobilized for the First World War, it was not alone. In the years before the war, there had been an arms race. All the major powers in Europe had their own mobilization plans. In the first two weeks, 20 million soldiers were off to war. By the time of the war, it was almost equally perfect in all countries. You absolutely had to keep up with the Joneses if you were not to be too late on the frontier. And so you got a situation where every move in the mobilization of every country was absolutely dependent on the moves of every other country. Well, that was very exciting for youngsters to get in these cattle trucks. And uh, some of us traveled on the roof until they came to a tunnel, came back with black faces. And there was a lot of random firing with our rifles at things in the field as we went by. And sometimes it stopped for a quarter of an hour. And then we'd go up and talk to the engine driver and he'd give us some hot water and then we'd make some tea. Once I walked across to a farm to buy some eggs, but just as I got there, the engine driver went toot toot. So we had to run back and get on. It was quite a picnic, traveling up. Millions of men were delivered to battle, and back home, entire industries were devoted to producing the materials needed for trench warfare. Huge quantities of food and ammunition and supplies were loaded onto an endless number of trains. The railways moved a vast quantity of materials and men constantly. There were shells and trench mortars, there was all the stuff we needed in the trenches, iron pickets and sandbags, and of course food. Men and arms had never before been moved in such numbers and at such speed. But there was a major problem. Once the supplies were unloaded from the trains, there was often nowhere to go. From that point on, they would have to be moved by men or horses. The British brought forward over one million shells for the Battle of the Somme. And obviously, without the railways, they could never have even started the job. But once all those shells were unloaded, once they were dumped in front of the railheads, they could no longer be moved at all. <laughs> 
When we arrived out there, there it was, the Western Front, the biggest man-made structure I should think it's ever been, 400 miles long from the Belgian coast to Belfont on the Swiss border. The real had dictated where the front was and no army was able to operate at more than 20 miles from the railheads if you launch an attack. And even when that attack was successful, once you got beyond that kind of range, you would be stuck. The Western Front barely moved throughout the four years of the war. Instead of the quick victory envisioned by von Schlieffen, each side bombarded the other, consuming men and arms at a previously unimagined rate. And as the years wore on, the landscape was chewed up until it resembled nothing on Earth. The railways had promised a war of movement. But what they delivered was the greatest static war in history, a war that left behind 10 million dead. As in the Civil War, what ultimately decided World War I was industrial might. The Germans were overcome by superior supplies, not superior forces. The First World War revealed the limitations of railroads. Timetables and stationary tracks were perfectly suited to the orderly world of peacetime, but in the chaos of World War I, railroads often came up short. There would soon be another war to fight. In the 1930s, a new arms buildup was underway. This time, the motor vehicle promised military campaigns that wouldn't depend on railroads. Armored cars, tanks, and trucks were now the vital elements of a mobile military force. But in the Soviet Union, railroads were still considered essential to any war. Railroads had helped the Bolsheviks take power and to retain control over the vast Soviet empire. Stalin saw the railroad as a key part of his military strategy, and Soviet railway workers were counted on for loyalty. On the smoke box of my engine was written for motherland, and there on the hatch there was a big portrait of Stalin. Here it was for motherland, and there it said for Stalin. In the 1930s, Adolf Hitler set about to rebuild Germany's military machine and industry. At the time, German engineers were building some of the most advanced steam engines in the world. But Hitler was a veteran of World War I and skeptical of the military value of railroads. He wanted a motorized army and build a new network of highways. Railroads didn't fit into his plans for German expansion. When he did travel by rail, he went on a personal train, which served as a mobile operations center complete with lavish cars and a large personal staff. The chef is Adolf Hitler. The chief was Adolf Hitler. We called him the chief. We never said Führer. We said chief. The train was the Führer's rolling headquarters. This must have been in the first days of the war. Here's the chief with Ribbentrop, the foreign minister. 
They sat in front of the train and made decisions. I only spoke to him once, even though we carried him and looked after him. If you encountered him on the train, you stepped back, of course. But the only time I was spoken to and asked something directly was this stupid business with the bath carriage. About 500 meters away from one station, there was a sharp bend. Suddenly there was a terrible noise and we braked. We jumped down to see what happened. The bath wagon, which weighs 81 tons, had derailed. Overnight, the coach was put back on the tracks. During all this activity, Goering graced us with his presence and bought crates of beer for the engineers, and we had to put up with his endless stupid advice. They came looking for me and told me I'd been summoned by the chief, that he had a question for me. I explained the situation and said to him, we're all ready for you to go. And he said, oh, don't bother. We don't need the train to get to Munich. Hitler preferred to travel on the roads. In March of 1939, after Germany took control of Czechoslovakia, he made his triumphant entrance into Prague in a Mercedes convertible. The swift Nazi invasions, blitzkriegs, that were to follow were carried out with overwhelming tank assaults and air power. But when France was taken in 1940, Hitler did find one symbolic use for the train. It was in this carriage that the Germans had been forced to sign the armistice of November 1918. Now, 22 years later, Hitler insisted on the very same location for the official French surrender. Germany's humiliation in World War I was finally avenged. In June 1941, Hitler launched the largest military invasion in history. Operation Barbarossa, Germany's invasion of Soviet Russia. It was classic blitzkrieg. 3,000 aircraft, 3,500 tanks, 150 divisions, all pushing eastward at tremendous speed, catching the Russians by surprise. In October 1941, the front line was broken through at Yartsevo, and on the 7th of October, Germans entered Vyazma. We, the ones who were still there, we climbed on the last engine. All of us, about 40 people hanging on, we headed off to Mozaisk. At the Konyanyo junction, there was a destroyed train on the track blocking the way, so we had to abandon the engine and get to Mezorskaya on foot. Then, from Mezorskaya, we continued by train. This is another scene from the Soviet film Road of Glory, made after the war. Classic Soviet propaganda, but it is based on what really happened during the Nazi invasion. When the war started, I was on the Bielorussian railway at the Gamel depot, which was on the front line. From the first days of war, I was working under fire because our railway was actually serving the battle forces. So all our trains had to be moved in spite of the bombing and shelling. The railways gave Stalin more time to assemble an organized retreat. On his order, entire factories were dismantled piece by piece. They were transported east of the Ural Mountains, far from the German advance. In this way, workers and equipment were moved to relative safety. The Russians rebuilt the factories, which were needed desperately for the massive war effort. 
As the weather began to grow colder, the German advance slowed. Because they had too few trucks to support a long war, the Germans needed the Soviet railways. But there was one problem. Russian railways operated on a different gauge. The rails were too far apart for German trains. So German soldiers set about to re-gauge entire lines so they could use their own engines and railway cars. Das ist natürlich eine ziemliche Arbeit. Man braucht einige Werkzeuge dazu. Man It is certainly hard work and you need several tools. You work a crowbar under the nail and hit it from the other side. Naturally, you develop a routine in time. You take the hammer and hit over the rail so that you hit the head of the nail, which is about a square centimeter wide, rather small. Working around the clock, the Germans were able to re-gauge several thousand miles of Russian track. But it was never quite enough. On most lines, there was still a point where Germans would have to switch over to Russian trains they had captured. A logistical nightmare. I was in Greece. I came to Russia in 1940 to work on the railways. We started off in the station Grimenschuk, which is in Ukraine. That was as far as the German lines reached. From there on, it was the wide gauge line leading into inner Russia. It was decided that we had to unload all the trains of the normal gauge to captured Russian wide gauge trains. This led to immense personnel problems. We were using Russian prisoners of war. They had to reload coal by hand without shovels so that it could be sent to the front. In Russia, distances were so large that the German armored forces ran out of steam long before they ever reached their objectives. And so they had to make use of the railways. By September, October, which were the critical months of the Russian campaign, they would need about 120 trains a day in order to keep all the armed force armies in Russia uh, completely supplied. And there were days in which they would get through 30 trains, 40 trains, sometimes not at all. For the Germans, there was an even bigger problem in 1941, the onset of a severe Russian winter. This time, the Germans were caught by surprise. Their equipment and training weren't sufficient for the extreme cold that brought their trains to a halt. The Russians were better prepared for the brutal weather. It was impossible to stick your head out of the cab if you wanted to have a look at the track. Your face was immediately frozen and tears wouldn't let you see anything. But anyway, the front needed coal and so did industry. So we moved these trains. Вот когда можно поблагодарить за опоздание. Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Видали, что у нас тут делается? Да. Налетит, разбомбит, а мы восстанавливаем. Он опять, и мы опять. Сегодня в шестой раз. Despite the weather and everything else, in November, German guns could be heard in Moscow's Red Square. Hitler ordered a further push into the city the Soviets had to prepare their defenses. Once again, Stalin counted on the railroads for help. In the far east of the Soviet Empire, thousands of troops were on alert for a possible Japanese attack. Stalin took a gamble, moving 10 divisions along the full length of the Trans-Siberian Railway. The troops arrived in Moscow and headed straight from the trains to the battlefield. 
it was the first major defeat for the Germans. A key factor was that the Russian railways were under the direct command of the military. As the fighting slowly turned from blitzkrieg to a war of attrition, tension mounted between the German military and German rail workers. One bad experience I had during the Great Freeze, a trainload of wounded soldiers in open trucks stopped at the station in Grimenchuk, wanting to go through. But we weren't allowed to let it go, because homewards we were only permitted to allow a certain quota through. The wounded were lying on straw in open wagons with serious injuries. The officer in charge wanted to get his patients home. And we weren't allowed to let them move, even though we had locomotives available. We couldn't permit it. The order from above was no more trains homeward. The famous German planning just hadn't worked because they hadn't thought about it. They'd, their assumptions were false, uh, and their assumptions excluded railways as a primary means of supply, whereas the Russians knew damned well that they'd have to rely on railways, partly because they didn't have roads, let alone autobahns, so they knew they'd have to rely on them, which they did absolutely brilliantly. It was a major turning point. Hitler had been determined to avoid the mistakes of World War I. But Germany now faced another long war. Once again, the railways would be crucial. Reichsminister Dr. Goebbels beglückwünscht die ausgezeichneten Eisenbahner. Es heißt heute, einen großen Teil der Kriegsentscheidung in der Hand haben. After the disaster in the Soviet Union, railways became an integral part of Germany's war effort. One new engine was called the War Locomotive, a simple design that could be mass-produced by the hundreds. Yes, see, look at the boiler. It's all simplified. We didn't use any sheet metals. Everything was reduced. We only needed to give it the finishing touches and assemble it. And the simple reason for doing this, less hours for production, less working hours, faster and more production to get the product out. It was all for the same end. The simplified design meant locomotives could be assembled in one-third the time. Better yet, the job could be performed by unskilled workers, prisoners of war and forced labor. In 1942, Germany's economy was fully mobilized for maximum production. Once again, war became a duel of industrial might. As the war dragged on, many experienced railway workers were sent to the front. They were easily replaced in the factory. One of the replacement workers was a teenage refugee from East Prussia. It shocked me when I heard that I had to become a railway worker because I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was that trains ran on tracks with an engine at the front. I asked myself what I was supposed to do there. I didn't have a choice. You couldn't choose your occupation. You had to go where you were ordered to. And this is what I did. My father worked for the railway. He repaired tracks, the old wooden tracks that had to be repaired for the war, because of the heavy usage. He was a very small man, and he had to carry the rails. We were put together in groups of Jewish male workers. We had to carry these potato bags, reload them into vans, and send them to other stations. It was at the Stettin station. Hard work. Very hard work. Of course, the campaign against Jews would go far beyond forced labor. The Holocaust really got underway at the same time as the war became total for Germany. That is, in the middle of 1941, when they invaded. From this time on, it was no longer a luxury war. It was a life 
to death war for existence. And under those circumstances, the limits of what you could do, even in Nazi Germany, even to Jews, fell away. Before that, the Germans were concerned to not to antagonize their own people. Whereas under circumstances of total war, as three and a half million uh, German troops battled against uh, the Soviet army, as millions and millions of Germans died, 80% of all Germans who died in World War II died in the, on the Soviet front. As their own cities, of course, were being bombed to smithereens, you could do anything. The Berlin suburb of Grunewald is one of the most opulent areas of the city. During the war, though, it was from the Grunewald station that most of the remaining Jews in Berlin were put on trains to be transported to concentration camps. 50,000 men, women, and children. Some understood where they were going. Many had no idea. Yeah, it's so schwer, mich nun umzudrehen and es zu zeigen, weil dann sehe ich. Yes, it is hard for me to turn around and show you this place because I can feel the despair again. To see friends arriving in open vans. And you know that there is a train waiting for them, a train of cattle trucks and goods wagons. Knowing what awaits them. Interessant is that a part of these people Amazingly, many of them didn't realize what was going on. They allowed themselves to be fooled. The SS officers asked, please leave your luggage on the left of the platform. It will be collected by goods wagon. And they did so. Very disciplined and very willingly, so they wouldn't be burdened with it. They had no idea yet that there would be no space for luggage in the cattle wagons. There would be 80 people in each wagon. At that point, I served them soup. And I even met friends of mine. We'd nod and say, see you soon. And they had their soup, something warm to eat, the soup. Then I saw them being pushed inside. The possibilities of railways encouraged two fatal vanities among generals. The first is because they could move troops and supplies so relatively fast in such enormous quantities gave them a feeling of omnipotence, that they were chess players. The second, and allied to that, was that because of railways they could command their troops far from the battlefield. And this gave them a sense of unreality, which I think was an absolute disaster. Now, this feeling of omnipotence and this distancing reached a sort of tragic crescendo in the Holocaust, which, of course, would not have been possible without an extremely efficient railway system. And that is the most tragic and ironic link between railways and the capacity to distance yourself from events, which was one strand in the Holocaust because so few people needed to admit to themselves what they were doing. The surprising thing about the Holocaust is how easy it was. I'll give you some figures. Uh, Six million people are supposed to have been killed in the Holocaust, including some members of my own family and from the Netherlands. Uh, out of those six million, probably two million or so were killed on the spot. The rest had to be transported to the various death camps first. Uh, 
A standard German military train of the time had 55 carriages. We mentioned this before. 50 persons per carriage, actually, you would get in more, but even if you take the standard figures, would be 2,500 persons per train. You could transport the whole 4 million people by this gruesome logic in about 1,600 trains. A spread over a period of approximately three years from the end of 1941, which is when Auschwitz opened, to the end of 44, when it closed. Approximately one and a half trains a day. This at a time, as we said earlier, when the German forces in Russia alone required over a hundred trains a day in order to keep fully supplied. So, relatively speaking, killing six million people was an easy, very small job. This is one of the amazing things about it. At a time when millions of Jews were being transported to concentration camps, a few managed to escape the death trains. Gatbeck hid on Berlin's network of suburban railroads and thus was able to save himself and many others. Da kommen wir zu einem Kapitel, wo wir der Reichsbahn danken müssen, dass sie Züge auch während des Krieges. We had to be grateful to the railways that the trains ran all night during the war. Those who didn't have a place to hide, especially during summer, took an S-Bahn train to Wannsee. This is quite far away, a 45-minute ride. Sometimes you could stay on the train all the way to Erkner at the other end of the line. You could spend a huge amount of time doing this. Or you could sit at the station and eat sandwiches if there wasn't a train back right away. You could pretend to be a worker coming from a night shift, waiting for a train for another one, one and a half or two hours. Many people spent their nights like this. As the German war effort became more and more dependent on railways, the rails became a valuable target for resistance fighters. In occupied France, the Germans relied heavily on the efficient French network of trains. But a few brave individuals were able to create chaos through bombing and other acts of sabotage. We didn't know at the beginning what we'd have to do. We didn't know there'd be parachute drops. We didn't know we'd have weapons and ammunition. It was quite complicated to start with. I kept this, which arrived in a parachute drop, in one of the British parachute drops. It's information on a greatly reduced card, with instructions and the places where we had to perform acts of sabotage. It's written in English, it's minuscule, and it took a lot of patience to translate it and to see what it said, what the instructions were. Their target was this important railway depot in Avignon. In 1944, the Allies were planning the D-Day invasion of France. It required a campaign of railway sabotage, complete with coded signals broadcast by the BBC. The message the signal was, the crocodile will eat the tough cow. That was the message. From then on, we had to attack the railway lines and the trains. In order to attack the trains, we had to go into the depot. 22 engines were destroyed. Similar attacks helped prevent the movement of German troops responding to the Allied invasion. The Germans were now caught in a vice between the Soviets to the east, the remaining Allies to the west. They feared the railways falling into enemy hands, but the Allied forces were fully motorized, 
German railroads were of little value, except as targets. One of my jobs was to draw up the train timetables, but they were useless now. It was horrible. During the day, there were always ten dive bombers in the air. As soon as a train moved, three or four would attack the locomotive. So they moved at night to avoid them. It was a wonder that they moved at all, but even that wasn't possible near the end. As in the Civil War and World War I, railways were both an asset and a liability. Ideal for supply, but inflexible and vulnerable to attack. Railroads have had a tragic role in modern warfare. They dramatically expanded the ambitions of warmongers they also promised quick victories, but delivered long wars and a scale of destruction never before experienced. At the same time, the railways did play an heroic role in confronting Nazi aggression, a role forever enshrined in Soviet folklore.